Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to my Houdini talk for GDC 2020 that is postponed. Uh, I'd like to thank SideFX for providing us with this alternative platform. Hopefully, you can reach more people despite uh, the current unfortunate situation. My name is Mai. Um, I'm a technical artist working in the game industry. And um, this talk is mostly about my uh, experiences in, in production in the past year of bringing uh, Houdini's powers into the real-time engine. Uh, my studio is called Xiao Games. It is a full-service studio led by award-winning game designer and author Jesse Xiao. We do a wide range of projects for companies, healthcare providers, museums, educators. And we also have our own games um, across different platforms like VR, mobile, desktop. Here's um, part of our portfolio. Um, it actually took me quite a bit to fit all of them into one page. And I will have to mention our newest title. It's called Until You Fall. It's a pretty awesome uh, VR sword fighting game where you have both, uh, you, both your hands will have weapons and you'll fight through. It's a dungeon crawler game, but with um, very sweet visuals and uh, electrifying music. I highly encourage you to check it out. It's on Steam and it also a bit of a workout because you're fighting enemies the whole time, physically. This is me. Hi. A little bit about myself. Um, I love to be in the outdoors when I can afford it. And uh, I think alternatively, if I, I don't have to do, do this job, I'll be uh, living in the mountains or in the wild or somewhere, maybe as a park ranger or something. Just a dream for the moment. Um, my other interests include like fine art. Um, I was educated in computer science and art, and I do uh, do abstract painting in my free time. So here's a table of content for the talk. Uh, we'll begin with discussing why Houdini, then we'll go into several big topics, um, including crowds, destruction, pipeline support, and production thoughts. Um, most of them are based on um, real stories uh, from, from the past year, and I think um, there was a lot of work being done and a lot of uh, lessons learned. Um, hopefully sharing that will benefit other people just because um, I, was, I was here last year and there are things I learned from the Hive in uh, 2019 that do actually benefit me in my work. So I think this is a pretty awesome community. Uh, before we begin, I would like to thank my uh, awesome teammates. And this is not the full team. Um, but this is just mostly the people who more directly contributed to the uh, pipelines and crowd destruction that we're going to talk about. So before we talk about why Houdini, and one thing I want to point out is the concept of problem solving. So I know this kind of looks kind of terrible and very, very abstract, uh, but in a way, this is what problem solving is about. It's the um, FX, it's, it's a function. Um, so I, I, th I found it useful um, based on my experience to, to think of problem solving as solving a function. So what is a function? It's essentially like an encapsulated box and that describes a solution. And when you think about you know, this function needs to accomplish something or your problem needs to be solved, it's basically there is a solution and it, it's inside this box. Um, your job is to find out, well, I will talk about what we need to find out in a bit, the process of problem solving. Um, the benefit of um, thinking this way, one of them uh, is you can subdivide this box because each box uh, we're treating as a, a solution to a particular problem and a problem can be consist of sub-problems. So this enable you to divide and conquer. And that's really helpful because it clears up the image. It's, it's less messy of a picture when the problem gets complex because you can look at them as being composed of several subparts. The second benefit is that it enables you to track down and analyze the cause and benefits in your system. Because once you have encapsulated um, several boxes inside it, you can 
uh, it comes with the automatic checkpoint. So you can, you can check like, if the input and output from this point is correct. Um, that is leading to the next step being um, having it throwing an error or something like that. But most importantly, uh, I think of thinking in this way, uh, as um, by which I mean problem as a function, is that it kind of forces you to think about what is the input and the output of this problem. And I find that very, very helpful. Because uh, this might sound obvious, but from personal experience, it's easier easier for Dawson than they're not um, that correctly describing a problem is really the prerequisites of solving it. Uh, you could go on work on a problem, but if we didn't find out what is the correct input and what is the expected output, that will mean you, you might be working on the wrong problem or the solution is not um, appropriate to the behavior of this, the, uh, this part of your finding, for instance. And this really uh, just not just apply to programming, even though it's, it's formed in a programming or math math mathematical term, but it has implications in every level. Uh, in general terms, um, the first line, I w which, which says, I want this to be nice and beautiful. It's a way to, to describe um, a requirement of a problem, but it's not really a, a clear way to describe it because there is no input. Uh, but if you compare that to the second one, which says, when this happens, I want this to behave this way. Uh, what this consists of is when this happens, it's it describes the input to this problem. Then I want this thing to behave this way. That is the expected output. So you have a clear image of what this function or this problem is supposed to do. And then your next job was 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 clearly to, to to build it once you have figured out what goes into it and what comes out of it, and you have a much better picture of how to build this thing. Here's some practical examples. Uh, first is more like a design level. You can say when the player uses a hard-earned weapon, they should feel more powerful. Here, the input is that excuse me, player have a hard-earned weapon, and the expected outcome is that they should feel more powerful. Now this is a design problem uh, to solve. Like how how do you is that, that design function? How do you write this function in a design term that the player can feel powerful? The second is like a three D art level. Um, it says my model needs to match the visual direction, but stay within the performance budget. Here the visual direction is the expected outcome, and staying within performance budget is the input. So. So input comes in many forms. It could be uh, data that comes in. It could be requirements. It could be restriction. In this case, it's like a restriction as input. Um, the challenge to solve here is how to do this and how to stay within budget and produce the outcome, which is meeting the visual direction. And the third case, which is more relevant to our talk today, is saying when the artist paint verts, the painted area should apply smoothing. So. What this means is that artist is um, putting the, the verts um, and the paint is the input and the output is that they should be a smooth smoothed. Um, the problem becomes, okay, how do, how do we make it happen? So as you can see, this uh, the idea of uh, problem solving black box, black box it, it can apply to different levels. And here's a funny situation is if you come look at these three lines, is that the bottom line, the, the output from the bottom line, sort of, because that's from a like tech art or engineering standpoint, the output of the bottom line serves the second level, which is the artist, and the output of the artist serves the director and design level. So it's a nice chain of uh, cause effect here. Once you have described a problem, now the next question is, how do we solve it? Um, since we we have isolated the outcome and, and the input, we can ask, do I have the read access to the inputs? And second question, how can I process the inputs to result in the desired output? This brings us to why Houdini is um, powerful in this sense. I borrowed a quote from Master Yoda. It says, for my ally is the force, and a powerful ally it is. 
so force to um in the in the cg industry in in the game um real-time game industry what could, what could force be meaning that, that we could borrow here i think it means data flow there are some very interesting um analogy if you can think about it is that it's kind of like they're talking about how you let the force flow through you and it makes you powerful and if you can if you can control the force you can manipulate it it also makes you very powerful uh it's the same thing with data in in our in our field if you can control the data if you have access to it and you let it flow through the pipeline effortlessly and that makes your pipeline powerful So the data will be with, will be with you always. So the data um, from a 3D art standpoint, they, they usually have typical classes like points, edges, faces. And then they have these kind of attributes like position, normal, UV color. Uh, these are the ones that are more familiar and more widespread across different engines or DCC. Then you have more specialized ones like weight, group, velocity, orient or other things that might be native to particular software. And the advantage of Houdini is that it allows you to describe and define a huge number of custom attributes. So you can track them and modify them, uh, give you way more options to do data processing. So many of the options, uh, many of the operations that we do in creating art or um, proceduralism is processing data at the core of it. Even though it's it's just like looking from a very long lens, but at the core of it, that's what's happening. And in Houdini, the data processing is handled basically by two components. You have the nodes and you have the code. The code could be something that the user writes directly and the node is something that built in and provides you with already um, a rich variety of uh, uh, functions. Now, what are those two composed of at the bottom? It's simply logic and math. Again, this is um, a long lens, but um, the reason I'm saying this is because this reveals something. The, the fact that all of them is essentially logic and math reveals that you have control over it because we're talking about if you have access to the inputs and if you have the ability to write the function in order to solve your problem, this means you can because you have all the access to the nodes and the code and the only thing you need to worry about is the logic and math. So that's where really the magic comes from, in my opinion. And the key part really is these two components and how you construct a problem um, algorithmically, how to capture behavior using logic and how to solve some problems that will be more difficult by, by manually doing it using math. So if you can describe a problem and because you have this amount of access to the data, to where the data is stored, who didn't, who didn't let you do this? So that means you have a good chance of solving it. To some extent, I think this means like a paradigm shift. You went from, I need a feature to do something to I just need a formula. Um, if there's someone is not there to build a feature for you, you can practically do it yourself. So in this sense, uh, I think Houdini has a low barrier of entry in terms of being able to create the tool that serves your needs uh, in a very handy and fast way. Uh, people sometimes have the misconception that, um, well, I, I don't know if it's a misconception, but um, it's subject to opinion that Houdini has a high left barrier of entry. Uh, but what I want to say is this is not necessarily true if you're thinking this way, because it does allow you to build custom, uh, from, from simple to sophisticated custom systems very um, efficiently and very visually. So like the title, it just needs to work on paper. That's, that's how I feel uh, in a lot of my project work in the past year that um, you know how sometimes in movies you, you see um, a character they, they draw in something um, um, with pen, pen and paper and they, they draw some underlines or circle something around the answer and they put the pen down and they smile that's the moment when you know 
this problem can be solved. Obviously, there, there's some more stuff inside the software to be figured out, but for the most of it, once I can work out a solution to problem on my scrapbook, I have a pretty good confidence that this can be solved. So let us bring, let us go to our first big chapter, crowds. I used a little bit of internet meme there, um, in case you're not familiar with it. I apologize if you, if the images look blurry, you have to downsample the, the GIF quite a bit for it to be played. So this is in Unreal and the environment and the character assets were downloaded from um, Sketchfab and uh, Unreal Market. This is basically uh, mostly a replicate of the system we used for our game, but um, in a demo. Cool. Um, hope you like that. And I know the the little knights they are running around pretty fast. Uh, the uh, cross simulation tend to look better when you spend more time iterating on it. But um, this is just a demo. Um, in, in actuality, uh, our animators spend quite some time over weeks to weeks and months to, to to get the the result that we wanted. So. Um, yeah. Anyway, um, from a technical standpoint, this is where we started, and this is our basically our first test to see if uh, Helene will work with creating uh, a crowd. So this is coming straight from a, the uh, game to uh, game dev game dev tools, the uh, uh, the vertex animation expo, the particle sprite mode. So. Um, what this is showing is um, a material preview in Unreal Engine. The data is exported from a Houdini simulation, and the the color that you see here is uh, the quaternion rot uh, ro rotation information because it's, it's a vector four, so we can bake that information directly into the uh, RGBA channel of um, uh, of the color data. Um, We've looked at other packages for, for the crowd at the time of our investigation initially. Um, one of them is uh, a Maya plugin that was used in film, is, is a pretty good tool. And they eventually decided to use Houdini because um, we already have Houdini and we know, we have this um, presumption that Houdini is gonna be good for this because a it's not just limited to doing the crowds um, as a tool. It will br bridge together basically a every part of the pipeline we might touch, and because it's in one package, so the, the data flow we expect to be um, pretty smooth, and we can have control over many aspects of it. So if we end up using a different tool, um, one of the things we'll run into first is if the tool is lacking a feature, then we're kind of it will, might be a dead end. Uh, we can't really modify the tool uh, itself. Whereas in Houdini, as we said before, we can basically build the behavior we wanted. Now, uh, what we need to happen is to have instance to mesh, and this is particles, it's not gonna work. We, we need characters, like, like you've seen double before, to, to run around in the scene. So, um, our awesome graphics engineer, uh, we call her ZZ, and she, she figured out how to do um, the GPU instancing. Basically, we created a compute shader to read from a position texture and rotation texture, both both of which encodes data from Houdini simulation. And the compute shader will need to modify the Unreal instance instance static mesh component. They have uh, three buffers here that's relevant. 
uh, instance origin buffer, which tells you the position of each, each instance, and the transform buffer, which tells you the um, the transform, and the state, which tells you whether it's active or inactive each instance. And uh, by by the original Unreal, they will not allow you to to access this data, uh, data after the creation because in this uh, two of the buffers, the instance origin instance transform is only written to the buffer one time at the creation. What we need to do is constantly updating how the game is playing because the data is coming from the textures and they will need to be sent to the buffer through our compute shader. One other thing that we're doing on GPU is to interpolate the position and rotation between frames on GPU. Uh, we have the options to um, maybe target the higher frame rate um, but uh, it might be cheaper to, to simulate on a standard 30 frames per second uh, to match some of our animation was animating 30 frames per second as well. And the, the final result using the interpolation on GPU is good enough, so we don't have to run a, a double the frame rate simulation. So once that tech is in place, actually uh, zero that working pretty quickly. And uh, we'll have something like this. Um, this is the asset from Houdini. You can see um, they have the correct rotation and position. It's actually the same simulation you saw before with the, the particles. Now, um, we, I, I naive, naively thought um, the hard problem is done at that point, um, how wrong I was. And the, the actually there's a lot of work to be done in the simulation side. Basically, we heavily modified um, Houdini's crowd simulation to 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 face the challenges that we have that, um, that might not be present in a lot of uh, standard crowd simulation. Uh, here's the first one. We were looking at uh, a scene that directly and that uh, it's it's on, on, on real level. So what I'm trying to show you here is going through the same process that we went through and see the challenges we faced and how we solved it. Uh, we grab this bunch of geometry and we'll just send them to Houdini and to make a terrain out of it. So when we have a flat ground or like a mountain, a, sl a slopey mountainous terrain, uh, it's it's relatively easy for, for agents to traverse. But if you think about having agents traverse in a terrain like this, you have um, all kinds of uh, challenging geometry that going up and down and uh, strange angles, sharp angles. Uh, it actually most uh, as far as we've seen the, the two, um, the, the Maya plugging and uh, the, the original Houdini we tested before is when agents trying to cross a 90 degree cliff or even sharper cliff, like uh, 135 degree, they just kind of force down and breaks apart because they, they can't track it properly. Uh, a lot of the terrain requires an up vector. And in this case, the up vector just pointing to every possible direction. And that's the main source of our problem. So we need to fix the terrain first. And one other challenge is when you're working in the game in production, uh, the game environment keeps changing as you are working on your crowd. Uh, sometimes it's, it's daily. So we can't really go in and uh, use Boolean or something to, to make a mesh for ourselves. Because the thing we need is one continuous mesh. Uh, we can't have a bunch of objects thrown together. That's not going to work. So in order to get one continuous mesh, uh, if you do it by hand, that will be quite a lot of effort. So we're looking for a way to do it procedurally. So we'll grab this thing and import it into it. It looks like this. The original raw geo has about 3.6 million triangles. Quite a lot. Um, so after some trials and errors, we found out uh, one way to convert that into uh, a more consistent mesh to get rid of so, so the problem is um, with the original geometry, a lot of the back faces are not there. Uh, if you don't see them, uh, the 3D artists usually don't model them. So it's it, you got intersections of faces, you got the missing faces. It's quite crazy. So in order to fix all of that, we convert it to VDB volume. Um, with VDB volume, we basically merge together different parts and we'll try to form a surface on the top of that volume. Therefore, it will give you a better representation of it. Um, even though at this step, it's still quite um, a lot of triangles that we can handle. 
but at least it's much less separate pieces. Uh, one other problem we we'll run into with VDB is sometimes uh, if there's a deep crevice or crease in the original model, you will create something like that in the uh, captured VDB resample as well. So what we do is basically we try to run a attribute render to de detect those cracks and crevices using Raycast. And once we have those points isolated, we could spawn a bunch of uh, spheres on them, uh, basically line up those spheres to fill up those cracks, then reconvert them uh, together with the first version of the converted polygon and do a second resample. This gives us um, a better representation without those extreme topology, which will be a nightmare for your crowd simulation. Uh, VDB conversion have this option of using uh, what is called uh, adaptivity that will reduce amount of the amount of triangles generated. But uh, eventually I found out that adaptivity doesn't work quite as well compared to a different node, which is poly reduce. So we could take the, the original to, to 22, I believe it's 22 million triangles and use poly reduce and it will bring this down to 1.2 triangles. And you can see the topology basically remains the same. Uh, one thing you might need to check out for is the there's a setting in the poly reduce that, that try to trade off between the quality of the triangle versus the quality of the surface capture, which means um, to have better surface accuracy, they tend to generate thin and long triangles because that captures curvatures better. Uh, except thin and long triangles might not be very good. You want um, more equilateral triangles as much as you can. So, so in in our experiments, we uh, heavily leaned towards having better triangle quality, and we have a step later to fix the um, inaccuracy part, which we'll delve into. Next step was we use clipping, and because VDB basically is a voluminous. It covers the whole 360 degrees. You, you go back faces and everything. So once we clip the back faces, we can throw away half sometimes amount of triangles that's there. Uh, there still might be something uh, hidden in the back. So this will happen if you have uh, the origin geometry is something missing in the back face, and there's like a little tunnel there that goes from the front of where player can see to the back where player cannot see. And that kind of tunnel, if it's big enough, the VDB conversion will preserve it. So the, um, the, the terrain topology that we have on the screen will try to follow the tunnel, go to the back, and still have a huge section of geometry where you can or you don't want your agents to reach. In that case, you need to like, identify those tunnels and block them. Uh, basically put a, a proxy cubes or something to block it before they're resampling so that they will get separated. Now, this is a technique uh, inspired by, uh, I think his name is Josku Tahan um, from last year. Uh, it's a very great example uh, of using the Raycast to, to identify and delete faces you don't want. So in this case, we have some bad faces that our agents never gonna touch and the players never gonna see. So like a, it's kind of like a, a, a cave on the side so what we basically did is put a few um, probes there and the probes surface is scattered with points and in the direction of the normal or you can randomize that direction or fire the point from the probe and let them hit the surface. So whatever primitive it ends up hitting, we can delete them. And to make the process even better, we could use a propagation uh, it basically a few lines of code in the render that you can let um, the neighbor primitives share the uh, properties of uh, of their neighbor. So if one one point is hit, it can tell its neighbor to to be considered hit as well within a certain amount of uh, radius. That's what that's what the, the blue spread that you see here, and the green lines are basically the the ray paths. Um, 
Another thing we did is the reverse of it. Um, in the previous slide, you see how to identify faces. We need to delete. And in this case, we're doing something about identify the faces that we need to keep. So we put a giant plane on top of the whole terrain and fire the, uh, what I call it, the bullets, fire the bullets downwards. And there's one feature. Uh, I, I'm not 100% sure if uh, just could build it uh, for that game, but we added this feature of doing a second bounce. So in the direction where your bullets fired, you touch the surface, you're trying to do like a ray tracing kind of thing, you bounce around the surface based on the incoming angle, then we define an, a cone of possible outcoming angles and, it will, and a possible radius you can bounce towards. So uh, because as you can imagine, if you just look straight down from the top of this whole topology, you're not going to see um, a lot of the, the the faces. So this bouncing around will let the points eventually after enough iterations to, to touch all the surfaces. Um, this is actually not a, not a very uh, time consuming operation. Uh, this stop runs relatively fast. As you can see here, um, we have a bunch of functionality here. We also have a mode which tells you to retry after invalid hits. So invalid hits could happen actually if you hit a bad surface or if you didn't hit something within the, the, the given bounce radius that we allow, then you can just randomize, randomize your trial and try it again. So this is the view of uh, what happened when we fire from the top and visualize all the ray path. It's really quite interesting. I think this is like a bounce, a bounce cone angle of uh, 60 degree, I think. And it, it forms this very interesting pattern. So yeah, after the rate hit filter, you can definitely get rid of any uh, topology you cannot really see and in the back, because if the rate doesn't see them, there's uh, enough uh, confidence for you to decide that you don't need them. Now, we have another challenge here. Uh, after our first iteration of terrain conversion, we put it in the game and we noticed that our origin is basically floating above the surface. And we wonder why. And I realized um, when we do the volume sample, um, in order to capture the result correctly, the volume sample needs to be um, a few centimeters above the, the actual geometry surface, like in the middle one. So we, if we sample uh, the middle one from the left, we end up with this one. That's quite fatter. And that's a problem because when you run the simulation, the agents will basically be floating above the surface. What we really want is the third one. And I'll show you how to, how to get there. Uh, one obvious thought was, okay, what if we take the surface normal and we reverse to push uh, the flat surface into, into the original tighter surface? That will create problems because um, you create this kind of very sharp uh, edges and intersections a lot of times. Uh, because you're not doing a flat surface, you're not pushing something in one direction, you're trying to push everything in every direction. And because the amount of topology, uh, there's a difference between amount of triangles and points um, from the original to the new one and several other reasons, you can't get a perfect match. So what we end up finding, uh, um, find, the solution we found is to do an iterative approach. So we do many iterations and each iteration we just correct by 0.1 per zero point by 10%. So if we detect the surface uh, using proximity, which is uh, the XYZ distance uh, uh, function, uh, we use that, it's better than the normal function. We, we use normal as a fallback. So when we do this, that tells you how, how far away you're currently from the surface, then we identify the, the vector defined by the proximity vector. Then we try to push the point towards that direction by just 10% of that vector. Then we'll try again, we'll remeasure and try again in the next iteration. So you can see that we have the surface difference measurement, we have the surface correction tab. And below that is quite important to have uh, fixes to the problem that arises. And the green thing you see in the screen illustrate the, the sharp points. And the sharp points, we have three ways to identify them using prints. Um, a small primitive angle or a small edge angle or large edge length ratio, basically. If, if you have a triangle which one of the edges is way longer than the other edge, it's a pretty good indicator that we might have a sharp points on our hand. And we have also ways to identify self intersection and fix them as well. 
So this is a final result for, for crack, and here's a visualization of uh, the color basically indicates how, how, how accurate you are to the original surface. If it's black, it's perfect. If it's in the blue, blue side, it's higher than the orange side, it's, it's, it's below the surface. So uh, you can see the results. It's reasonably good. Um, there are areas uh, below the leg, because uh, in the original geometry, it's basically just there's a cavity there. And if you have you feel on your surface to be more smooth, and matches, so there's a, a logical contradiction. You can't be matching the cavity that well with the amount of limited triangles you have, meanwhile preserve its smoothness um, that's needed for the terrain. So be careful not to smooth things too much or my, you might end up with a standard man. So this is a comparison between uh, the terrain, convert, uh, the, the, the original, idea of if we just use a straight up one iteration 100% correction without fixing any uh, intersectional sharp points, we can detect like quite a huge number of uh, problematic points. Um, but with the improved method, we end up with something like this. We have no self intersections and we only have like a less than 1% of the original amount of sharp points. It captures the fine details very well, like uh, even uh, when you see here, like little poles or rope, it's almost like a perfect match. So the no-match surface has, uh, it's 20 centimeters above the original surface. And the match one is only one centimeter above the original surface. For some characters, 20 centimeters is quite a difference, like one part of the leg could be that length. Whereas one, you basically would not notice the difference. And in fact, you have control over how tight you want it to be. Um, we just set it to, once you reach 1%, we'll just stop. It helps a little bit when you stop, because if you, if no points stop iterating, the there will be a push and pull between trying to target the surface and trying to relax. Just relax, ultimately pull things away. So at one point, if the uh, point is in the grip, enough position, which is tell the point, okay, stop your iteration now. So that would be pinned. Now we thought, okay, we fixed all, all the turn problems, everything should run fine now. Now we're just like halfway there. Um, here comes the next big problem. Uh, what you see here is that whenever uh, agents trying to traverse through uh, like cliffs or sharp turns upwards or in other directions, you see sometimes they just straight falling down or they penetrate the surface. The behavior we wanted to see really is this, and this is the result of we implement our fixes. We'll get to how we do how we did that, but just to illustrate what is the expected behavior we're trying to see. And you see a little square in the center right of that. That's to show that we want to make sure when the agents run as fast towards that square, Excuse me. He doesn't penetrate it or it doesn't land on it. Uh, he, here's a problem that we realize what is causing all this is time step. Uh, when when the, the agent position updated, they jump one time step and propose a new position and move it towards there. So if the time step is big enough relative to the topology, it will land the agent somewhere where they can't find a downward surface or they are inside another geometry or another, they're, they're behind the surface already. So the first logical way of fitting that is to reduce your time step. And that basically means you have to sample or you have to run the simulation for a much longer time. That is time, time, time consuming. The second problem with that is that you, you can't really get a guarantee of when this will stop happening. And if you, if you, like to say a uh, half your time step, then you need to, for some reason, speed up your agent for twice as much. Then the uh, saving you get from the time step is strong because the time step times the speed to give you the original displacement. So we need to find a better way of doing this. One thing I found out, uh, well, this is our, one thing I found out that we need to do is first identify what is, when will this happen? So going back to our uh, original problem solving thing, we're trying to find out uh, the input of it. And we know the input comes from um, 
the uh, the delta position, and we can detect therefore if a problem occurs by comparing that vector defined by that delta position against the surface and see if the proposed displacement will penetrate the surface or if we'll put the point in a point in they can't find uh, the ground in a reasonable distance. When that happens, we'll do this, what we call surface probing. This is the first iteration of surface probing. What it does is uh, for a point when it's caught in a problem, problematic state, you would send out a imaginary probe. Like the point is not moved yet, but it's another probe that tried to iteratively move forward. So the rule is you move forward 90 degree to your surface normal at the uh, secondary sampling point and keep doing that, um, like basically tiny steps. And every time when you do, uh, do the uh, projection in the, the orange vector direction, we will apply the XYZ distance function to do the find the target closest surface position. So you, you do like a shoot, a snap, a shoot, a snap. So in this way, I thought we can guarantee that you will always be sticking to the surface with a reasonable accuracy. So yeah, this is the first version of surface, prob surface probing. Surface probing is basically activated whenever the, the standard traversal creates a problem that we detect. The second thing I wanted to solve is really knowing um, if I'm landing on a place where it's connected to the original triangle, the original primitive I'm on, and that becomes quite problematic because uh, in order for an agent to know that, yes, you can query the, um, the ground and ask the ground who are your neighbors, but it becomes more expensive if you're trying to search for further distance. And it still becomes I might be wrong, but I think it becomes impossible to f have all the points, all the agents, say if we're running thousands of um, agents in a simulation and have each of them query the ground at the same time, every frame to see if they're landing in the primitive that's connected to the original primitive they were on in the last time step. That becomes, an ins yeah, yeah, I don't think that's doable because to do that, you need to write data to the ground. And because there's only one copy of um, the uh, terrain geometry at the time, instead of let's say 1,200 copies for each, uh, each, each everyone's update. So if you, the standard propagation is performed on the geometry itself, so the geometry query its neighbor, you can't have the points simultaneously tell geometry to do different queries at the same time because of, yeah, I hope I, hope I explained that clearly. Um, uh, so the solution I found to this is what if we do it not in simulation time, but like bake it and to bake it, basically we have each primitive um, already calculate um, what are the primitives is connected to them in a given radius. And we still need an optimization here because as we said before, um, Mostly random nodes is running on a point, a primitive, and they, they are running as if they, uh, they don't depend on information from the neighbors while they're running it. So everybody acts independently, then they come together to the result at the same time. So um, the normal propagation is updated throughout the time. So you, you spread, then spread, then spread. Uh, it depends on the, and the neighbor to be written to, to, to have new data. But if everybody is doing this at the same time, they can't all read, write data to the neighbor at the same time. So they have to do it themselves. So what I did is created um, a few arrays. Um, in this case, the different colors here indicate four different arrays. One is for, for initial, the blue is the, the one. Blue converts primitives to red. Red indicates the border of the current search area. Um, and um, the yellow is called a buffer area. Uh, it's yellow just encapsulates everything that is uh, not touching the outside, but like right, bit, right underneath the red. So once everything is moved to yellow, uh, if it doesn't touch any, uh, 
basically what everything inside the yellow we don't need to search them anymore when you compare if a point is 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 already added to your array you need to search what's turned in the array so all the green area is distorted for the comparison so that's why i have a buffer area there uh, in this way we can run this calculation simultaneously for all the primitives say we have um about half a million triangles in our thing and each point needs to calculate who their neighbors are within a dimmer radius and it is it, it took about 15 minutes to do a one meter radius check yeah it's relatively expensive but at least now it's doable and we can bake that once the data is ready uh, it's, it's very cheap to query in the runtime so i need to drink some water Because every agent at each step just needs to look down at the feed and ask the primitive they're landing on which primitive numbers are in the array that you have is defining as a reachable neighbor. So if it's not found, that means this agent has landed on a place that it's not supposed to land on because it's like so far away from the original point. Here's um, a visualization of how it works in game. So we kind of isolate one point and see um, throughout the time um, the, de the detection of the neighbor of its current position. And the gradient you see here is basically like a normalized uh, distance from the center. So as you can see how nicely this, this check wraps around crazy geometry, that does give us exactly what we wanted to see if um, definition, if, if a surface is reachable along the topology of the surface to where I'm currently at, uh, instead of doing any kind of uh, ray casting in 3D space, because when the topology becomes very detailed, ray casting is bound to make some errors. But if you travel uh, basically triangle by triangle along the surface, that gives you the accurate surface distance. So I started to test this with that built-in on, on crazy topology like this and see if see as a stress test and see if everything goes right. Um, most cases goes right. Unfortunately, there are quite a few number, maybe like five percent or ten percent of agents are still going crazy in some boundary cases. And that led me to discover this. The the original surface probing was not it's not perfect, it's not a good design. Here's the reason. Say if you're trying to leave from a pointy point, um, like the point we're showing here, there's a chance that when you do the, the normal projection and the orange arrow that shoots you out, we will put you in a position where the closest point will always be, um, where the white arrow will always push you back where at the point is, and you basically just stuck there because the, the you're shooting by the normal and the normal of that surface is fixed and you should start going up and down up and down because the wire always you bring it to the closest point and that point is the surface uh, the other thing is if you land on the point like that the normal you get might not be the normal you wanted you might you might want the normal of the the face that's on the other side but you don't really know which primitive you hit because you hit a point where they, they met um, we can do a check uh, that is, we, we tried that patch one time to do check, just like see if this um, if this is not the normal I wanted, I, let's try the next normal it's, uh, that's available at this point. That can work, but the one thing that does not work is the proximity push you right back where you are. And it, what if the next normal also puts you right back where you are? It returns from crazy. One of the tests we often think about um, as a stream case, it's just to test if, if an agent is traveling along an edge of a cube. So it's traveling along the edge of a cube and it's trying to cross a point of that cube. And you can picture that in your head. It's, it's a very weird situation, but it might happen. So, um, so basically, I have to understand if I have defined the, the correct behavior for the agent to do in that position. I'll just speed up a little bit, I'm kind of running out of time. So the newer method we discovered uh, was something similar to the idea of traversing on um, a flattened UV topology. Our topology is just kind of too crazy to, to be able to UV unwrap and make them flat and travel on it. 
but the the idea can be implemented. So uh, here the green arrow show the, the green line shows you where the um, the toy is supposed to move. The deep blue arrow is the right vector, and the the cyan arrow is the up vector. So it's it's trying to go in the direction of the yellow vector, and there's a very sharp fold edge underneath it. Um, one of the most straightforward way of thinking is to to bend the yellow vector around the the dark blue vector and see how how it lands. But that is not very uh, accurate. Not, that's not very realistic of how things will move. So we will try to represent this problem as if um, if you to unfold this edge that was folded, where would the where would it meet the yellow vector? So if we like flatten this and just rotate the the, the edge and the, the face that's underneath the edge upwards and see if it meets the yellow, and that's where the the orange is. Um, this is based on a very nifty um, function called uh, Rod Rodriguez rotation formula. It's very efficient. And basically what we're trying to do is if the k is the edge and the, the vector v is the forward vector, forward vector and the on the other side is what we're trying to flip towards is the uh, v rot, v rotation, rotated. And th theta here is the, the angle of that fold of your edge. So uh, we have now a rather complex uh, way of validation just to make sure that our traversal data is correct. First, we do a bunch of ray intercept tests, and that's composed of the terrain projection test, uh, terrain penetration test to see if the delta vector penetrates the surface. Then we do projection test to see if it can land. Then we do a local surface cache check, which tells you if you're landing on a, a close enough surface. If any of those fail, we'll do the surface probing. Surface probing, what we basically try and do is um, you will travel along the triangle per triangle. If you reach the edge of a triangle, you find what's on the other side of this edge, and you transform your vector to that space, then you continue traversing. So it's, it's literally traveling um, primitive by primitive along the primitive surface, and there is no way you can produce a 3D space arrow. So if you cross a point, we, we have a detection here, we handle the special case. If you cross a point, we will basically slide you along um, the, uh, the, the hedge, the half edge um, that you in penetrated. Uh, so you don't cross a point, you cross the half edge instead uh, with a little bit of offset. After that, you can set the final position. Now, um, paths. Path is something uh, we need to be very art iterable. And in, in our game, we did the uh, the path that the crowd is supposed to follow using splines in Maya. And here I present an alternative flow where you can do it. So you put the path in uh, in engine using the obvious spline mesh. And we take the spline mesh, we can convert it into um, a curve in, in Houdini. And here you can see on the right side, we basically put a bar there. To, to mark all the destination points. So, so the green points are the beginning of the curves, and this way we can um, procedurally identify where the what endpoint of each curve is. Um, the, the trick is we need to make sure on each curve, the point number goes from zero to one from the green points to the blue points. Because when we do um, path-based traversing, um, the point number is what we're using to identify the direction and the tangent of the curve. Uh, of, of the curve. Now, um, from the green points, we project them onto the terrain and they are propagated to create patches where we're going in spawning locations. And the data basically flows from the spline to the patches. And then when you scatter points, uh, basically spawning agent scatter points on the patches, they can inherit the data that's in the primitive. So here we have an example of the nice data flow I was talking about earlier. From, you go from attributes written to the spline two attributes as propagated to the, the green patches of spawning locations, then these attributes will be inherited by the points that were spawning in these locations. One of these attributes um, that's useful is uh, the speed. So we have a curve to adjust how fast you want the agents to move on a particular spine. Um, that's shown in the color here, in, in the color visualization range. And the other thing is uh, how many um, 
we want how many agents want to spawn on each original location. So we have this giant spreadsheet sort of interface to, to the artist control um, exactly how many agents to spawn. This is the kind of crazy setup to control the speed. We current, for our game, we supported up to like 30 splines and our animator um, used all of them. I thought it's quite a lot, but uh, it's all used up. Now you can see uh, how they move. You can see the speed difference. So we also did something called uh, uh, our customer speed speed range. So uh, this is applied on top of what CrowdSolver does. So we have very precise control over the range of speed we wanted. And we give you a speed fluctuation. Basically, uh, the, the direction that we want um, the agents to move in a random speed, but we don't want randomness to happen on a per individual basis because that, that will create basically bad traffic. Uh, and imagine if a group moves fast, it needs to move fast together. So we define the noise in the spatial terms. Uh, here's just an illustration for, for artists to, to see how, how high is the frequency they're setting. And as, as the points moves through, they will basically pick up the same spatial noise that's illustrated before, and they'll move them faster and slower as, as clumps. Here's another curve, which is just how fast and like, how, how the agent starts. So you can get like, they don't start all at the same time, but they, some, some of them start faster, some of them start slower. This curve decides that. We also implement the orientation restriction. Sorry, I'm flying through this pretty fast. Um, there's only a few minutes left. I'm timing that. Uh, something we also implemented was the obstacle uh, avoidance, position-based obstacle avoidance. So Houdini provides you with a force-based avoidance uh, lookup where you want something a bit more accurate. Uh, so we use three different methods to, to calculate a reflection vector, a repulsive repulsion vector, and rejection vector. Uh, rejection means that if you are stomped on by a moving object, uh, that you're inside its volume. Um, we can detect that and we can push it out. Repulsion is trying to keep agents away from the surface. Uh, reflection is a straight up look, look ahead and see if you're going to collide, then um, prim preemptively redirect your position. Um, then we have this, which is the yellow points uh, in, uh, in, indicate uh, where the, the the collider is in is penetrating the uh, terrain. So if you are caught inside it, that gives you the direction where you should be ejected from, basically towards the yellow point, not towards uh, the volume gradient direction. Just the volume gradient direction when the point is not perfectly on the when the volume is not on the surface, it can point to some extreme direction. Here's, we have another problem. No, it is off. Ah. Here's to have. Um, have the agents not stuck? We find out agents stuck uh, pretty often. Um, what will happen is they, um, they are guided by the direction of the spline, but if the direction of the spline is pointing in uh, away from the surface they're on, basically tell them to go up or down, they'll be trapped there. And the spine will be, the only spine they can sample is, is all within that kind of um, unfeasible range. So they will start at the corner there. So what we come up with is a technique called space colonization. It's used for, uh, originally for growing vegetation along um, a point of uh, cloud points. So we will be growing, um, Finds essentially if it's a finite pattern from uh, original spline in the in the reverse direction of their their traveling direction of tangent. So, so we create this kind of um, auxiliary trails or we call it auxiliary trails because once a point is detected as stuck or it cannot find the spline anymore or if it's too far away from the spline, um, they will basically fall back to the auxiliary trail, and basically it's like. Um, substrings um, that flows back to the main river. So if you follow the substreams, you will eventually land on that. And this is how we generate it. It actually looks quite, uh, quite amazing looking. 
So um, using that method, we mostly fix the problem. They can't always follow because because, uh, because the imagine the the, um, the vine grows from the original spine. It, it will grow to cover all the surfaces available. So if you just follow the reverse direction, it will lead you back to the spine always. And we have pathfinding controls that tells you to abandon the path if you are in the um, strange position or in the problematic position. You fall back to using or to the trail. So you can also paint air problematic areas where you're forcing the agents to use the auxiliary trail instead of the main path. Here we see something. Um, what what is this here? It's basically showing you the uh, the action of the uh, uh, dynamic avoidance I was talking about earlier, and we see some problems here. Um, the avoidance is, is okay, but um, the agents are clumped together too much and they're just running into each other. And what happens here is uh, at the bottom of this scene, the spine's ended, so there's no more directions provided. So when, you, when agents reach the end of the spine, they basically will circle around that area. And that makes it hard for you to... Um, so you, say if you have a group of soldiers and you, they reach the target position, they want to kind of slow down and stop there, and make a formation of some sort. This makes it difficult to, to, to reach that formation because everybody's running into each other and there's not enough space. And imagine if some some group of your soldiers stopped and your other group is behind them and their target is before the group that has stopped, that will prevent them from reaching that position because the spine has so, it's, it's reached its end. There's so limited control you can provide the agents at this point. So. Um, we need to find another solution to basically have better control when the crowd gets very dense and in this kind of dense area uh, the spine will fail to do what it can originally do when they are sparse um, it's, it's still it's, it's the same concept of space colonization but we we'll transform that in instead of growing things we just like move points so here like the color indicates the the order of um, when they should stop so the, the blue areas will stop first and the point density will influence where where the agent is going now this how this algorithm works is that instead of agent doing the searching the the, the points and the space points will search towards the agent so Every point in space is paired with the agent, so you, you will not see. Um, uh, you have a very nice distribution of space because the straight space itself distributes towards the agent. And what you can see here is that once once we run this and the the density, we can control the density uh, and the target position uh, of our movement. It's quite transformative compared to what originally um, capability we have. Here it shows you um, how they stop. Basically, the, the darker area is once once they, when the points stop there, they will kill the points in their immediate vicinity. Uh, once um, space points or food points are killed, uh, they can no longer pull agents towards them. And all these lines you see is basically space points trying to pull agents towards the, in their average direction. And when there's no no space points, they won't get pulled towards there. Now, this is with that implemented. We, we also have the, the dragon to kill the space points right beneath it. So it gives us better avoidance of the dragon as well, but also much better avoidance between the agents themselves. This is in action. Um, it's each agent. It looks like agents are searching for space points. It's actually the reverse is happening. The space points were pairing towards the agent, but they also check against um, a field of view. So each vision you can control whether you can see 120 degrees or 60 degrees in front of it. If it's if it falls out of a range, that, that relationship is distorted. And this averaged influence lines will basically control where the agent moves. Um, again, because it's the points search towards the agent, that give us a distribution of space. Nobody is sharing resources, really. So no matter how tight the pack together, they'll always have a little area for themselves. Finally, uh, we found a way to export the animation uh, from Houdini to Unreal 1 to 1. So what we basically did is we, we collapse all the animation cycle that we'll be using for the agent into one giant clip. 
and we use a vertex shader soft uh, soft mode edge board uh, to, to to generate this, uh, the texture on the left which tells you the the, the basically the, the the composite animation clip then we encode the animation state data in terms of which clip you're using and what frame of that clip you're using into the position texture of that captures the whole crowd. So the whole crowd has a position texture as an RGB A, and the RGB tells you the position, and the A is used to tell you animation state. So what we do in the, in the shader uh, that animates and deforms each agent in our real engine, the shader will query the crowd data texture uh, and see this agent at this point is supposed to supposed to play um, what frame of animation then you'll go back to the left texture to to find out which uh, v in terms of uv which v i'm supposed to be sampling from and in order to achieve that uh, zz our graphics engineer found a little way to um, pass the agent id number so i can read that in the shader so once i have the agent id number i have all the inputs i needed and i sample the crowd texture then i sample the uh, composite animation texture. That way, the animation can be transferred one-to-one -one from Unreal to Houdini. Sorry, uh, the, the other way. So yeah, a list of features we built. Quite a lot. Um, destruction. So um, we started to implement this philosophy of um, building pipeline tools for destruction. After we'd done um, initial rounds of destruction asset, we realized a lot of repetitive work and we wanted to be able to standardize the process and also reduce errors. So what ends up happening is um, we build a whole pipeline of tools um, that encapsulate separate actions. It's a bit like the function idea I was talking about earlier. So you don't have to redo them again and also they're standardized to prevent you from making a mistake if the action itself is complicated. In this case, it's, it's um, to, to do a layered fracture is, is relatively complicated, somewhat complicated to set up uh, because you want it, the best result, you want it to loop through each piece after each layer of level fracture, then you fracture them again. So this is just one node that controls this and visualizes it for you. This is uh, in use. Another fun thing we did is um, the uh, constraint. Constraint. We have a whole bunch of constraint network nodes to to, to automate the process a little bit. We start with a constraint builder. So you grab pack, pack pieces, then we build three types of constraint, proximity, contact, and structural. Proximity based, based on one type of the um, uh, fine connected pieces node that builds constraint between pack pieces based on how far, they, how close they are to each other. Contact constraint search um, if the two pieces have actually surfaces touching. And structural constraints is built between the verts. So if you cut for the surface, every, every point you cut, there are two points on the two separate pieces that are right on top of each other. So we build a constraint there as well. And to imagine as a surface constraint, that they're usually the strongest type of constraint because it means that you have to break the surface to break those. Um, mostly our code constraint workflow is driven by group. That really cleans it up. Uh, everything can be we can do group group logic. We can identify the attributes by like what types or what sizes they are to, to define certain groups. Then we can do plus and minuses with groups to, to get the um, uh, different isolation we want in order to apply different constraint um, properties to them afterwards. So when we get to the constraint edit node, this is basically uh, in channel four uh, RBD constraint property node. That we need to have a composite together. Then we'll build this interface of spreadsheet. Then it makes it much easier for you to assign properties and track them and compare and iterate. And once this is um, decided for the first time, you can click the uh, create constraint relationship node at the bottom left. That will automatically build all the constraints you needed inside your .NET. Um, that will also make it easier because if you, you have to manage to create all the nodes one by one, then um, update them every time you change something. Uh, sometimes we're using up to um, 10 or 20 constraint relationship. Uh, that's quite a lot to manage. I think I exaggerated, maybe not 20, maybe like 
8 or 12 as extreme cases. Uh, the other thing we found quite useful is the constraint switch node. Uh, this exists in um, a sub node inside the top network. So in the top network, if you want to modify the sub geometry, you need to create um, a sub solver. Uh, and in there, it's usually you modify your constraint geometry. One of the things that constantly we need to do for things like metal destruction is that the constraint needs to be switching between um, glue and soft or glue and uh, hard constraints uh, rather frequently back and forth and it's it's not a very easy setup to have to do it every time and um, make sure you don't make any mistakes and uh, in this way we provided a uh, HDA which have most of the functionality or the checks you need uh, expressed as UI so you can you can do logic or an R and you can decide when a condition is met, so you want to ignore, or you want to break the constraint, or what you want to do with it. And when you break the constraint, we can also decide to break it forever or allow you to switch back. So um, one important thing to do, um, kind of semi-elastic or like uh, deformable thing f um, using, our, um, using RBD is to update the constraint length once it's switching between different constraints. So we have that option as well. So I think here's an example of um, of a glue constraint and a soft constraint switching between between each other. And to, to emulate something like maybe like soft metal, you keep hitting it, it will keep deforming, and you will try to stay stable after it defor deformed. So here's that in practice, and this is we're trying to build something like a reinforced glass breaking. Yeah, because of reinforced glass, it kind of it bends as well as breaks. And this is for metal deformation. Uh, metal deformation is probably the, the most difficult types of destruction I, I worked with so far. Uh, yeah, uh, it requires with some additional steps. Here's something I want to touch on about. Um, it might be useful sometimes to, to use the Voronine destruction, uh, Voronine fracture to, to fracture pieces. Uh, reason being that uh, it can be procedurized better and there are shapes that might be harder to get with um, depending on workflow to, with with the uh, boolean color in this instance but if you use for or not, um, it might be hard for you to match this with the original geometry in order to do deformation you basically need to take your Voronoi copy of destruction and find your original geometry and cut it in the same way so in order to do that, we can take a piece, for instance, we do the whole switching to, uh, converting to VDB and converting back to poly thing and give us this high, nice thing and use that to, to cut the original geometry. Once it's cut, we get all these points and we can group them using um, volume at the end to identify which points th is inside uh, the area that I want. Then we can isolate them. Uh, the next step is to get rid of some areas that we don't need. So in this case we run an algorithm that just finds the largest pr connected primitive and throw with everything else so you can see some areas were thrown away then we isolate the inside faces then we condense them uh, basically we run fuse on the inside and outside separately then fuse them back together then we run poly reduce on the inside faces to, to drastically reduce the poly amount we need now this is a good, good enough topology that we can uh, deform. This is the uh, setup. If uh, you're interested, you can pause the video and look at it. Uh, here's another interesting thing we, we made for our convenience is to have um, animation-driven data. Uh, a lot of our destruction were animation-driven, so you have an animated character in this case trying to, to destroy something. So this does... Um, uh, an in-volume data transfer. So when, when the, the target points are inside the animated character's volume, uh, it will inherit its velocity, its frame, or a different modes we have. So we could use, like, um, in the bottom left, it's the uh, kinetic energy as getting transferred to the uh, destructible services. Or on the top left, so we have the first frame of like when the first contact was being made. Both of these were used in our production to inform the, the fracture of this destruction. So like dense points 
uh, points where it's dense kinetic energy or with high kinetic energy might be uh, density fractured, uh, something like that. So this whole system of HDI, HDA um, destruction pipelines basically um, enabled us to, to build more complex and sophisticated visuals because uh, there's less things to worry about and you can think in, on a higher level. Once a tool is doing the job it's supposed to do, you don't have to worry about what's inside that tool. And sometimes uh, it can be quite a uh, sub-network inside it, but once you have HDA, then you can build on top. All right, third chapter, pipeline support. And a bit of over, I'm not sure. Um, what's going to happen to the video, but um, in any case. Um, there's an imaginative range of applications that we can think of. Uh, that's this, These are the ones that we actually used in, in game, and there's a bunch of ones that's um, experimental. So here, we um, we would have to import and complex rig at vertex animation, uh, like the dragon, for example. That, that whole thing is vertex animation. It could be rigged, but there are, there are cases where our rig is just not importable to Unreal. In that case, we just would capture the deformation of the geometry directly in Unreal, in, in Houdini, and export that as vertex animation. That would get, get the job done. And it's quite performant as well. And Houdini is also useful to to um, basically re-engineer some particle systems. Um, particle system because they draw core amounts in in Unreal Engine could be quite uh, a dramatic performance impact. A lot of that system, if it's static um, or um, scripted enough, you could uh, just bake the whole thing in Houdini, then it becomes one draw core. Uh, it's also useful to use Houdini's uh, geometry context to do shader prototyping for especially vertex um, wall position offset in Unreal Shader. So Unreal Shader does not really give you fast enough or good enough of a feedback when you're prototyping your um, wall position offset shader in Unreal. But in Houdini, you can track it, you can read the data, and um, you can make sure it works correctly. And the, the process of transferring your, your vertex code in, in Houdini to, to Unreal Shader Rough is relatively straightforward. You can you can match everything you build here. Uh, draw core visualization was helpful in our optimization phase. Uh, what that does is we can grab the whole thing directly from Unreal and um, uh, that we can grab all the instance meshes and merge them together. What we want to know is to see uh, how many draw cores we have in the scene, so 3D artists can can um, optimize the thing. Uh, what will happen in, once it's inside Houdini is we, we grab the name string and we grab the material string uh, and we add them together. So once we have that, each unique combination of name plus material becomes its own draw core and that can be randomly colored in Houdini. And we export that as a whole mesh back to uh, Unreal. It becomes very straightforward to look at that mesh and look at different colors. Be like, if there are two areas with different colors, we know that's two different draw cores. Maybe we can combine them. And we also use it for concept art support. Here's something that's uh, like a side uh, spin off of the ray casting thing I was talking about before. Um, I used the sort of the, the fake ray tracing method. I put it between two planes, and it would generate this kind of patterns once it's bouncing between the planes with the um, trends. And it was, it was different settings. Um, I think the, the bounce angle and bounce radius allowed would control what kind of pattern you're generating. But it is but interesting once we convert that into something else like this. Um, I start to notice that this looks like a dungeon, and I wonder if this could be a way of like procedurally generated dungeons. Um, you could basically that would be your floor map, and then you, you could build the sides from this. And the, the interesting fact is we're not emulating something directly from from, from a function that's trying to emulate it, where we accidentally build a function for something else. But once we flatten, kind of we flatten that to a diff, like a lower dimension, and we end up with a pattern that's more organic than trying to simulate that pattern, use some function yourself. So that's kind of interesting too. Um, here's a clipping method. It's um, inspired by the same idea behind the, uh, the box clipper tool. Uh, here, something I did that might be different is um, 
I was looking for ways to to make better patches once you once you clip things, uh, and add rotation functionality to it. And the patch thing basically works like this: once you uh, before you cut um, make a clip, you can group all the edges that's in the current state. Then you compare that to the after cut. You find out all these edges that's not existing in the original cut. But this is not really the edge you wanted. There are some wrong cases. Then we ran a wrangle to, to identify those cases. And throw them away, then you have a clean edge. Then you cut multiple times, and every time you cut, you will have a clean edge because until at the end, something like this happened. One trying to identify the edges for for the patches that are made. So I can correctly assign normal. What happened here is um, when we have edge that's in the group, but you cut through it, then once that in the group edge got cut in half, none of its part is in the group anymore because the original edges have disappeared. So we need to do another validation check, patch by patch, to check if each edge has an in patch side and out patch side, basically. Then we can restore that and we end up with something like this. That's all the surfaces that's created. Uh, that's all the edges that's got cut. All right, finally, um, production thoughts. It's me confused at work on typical sunny day. Life of a tech artist. Uh, I'd say it's a 40% frustration, 40% happiness. In terms of some time, I keep thinking about what did not think of that before. And believe me or not, this, this happens so often. You think you found a solution, then at some point later, you realized there's a better way to do it. And I guess the process of keep learning and building up on stuff um, makes it easier, makes it less likely for you to make mistakes and you can see a better picture better. So to avoid pitfalls, um, recommend to communicate um, the process of your workflow and make sure everybody on the team is on the same page. And it's also important to commit the expectations of, from the um, from different levels and what kind of visual they're hoping for. That usually translates to different amount of work. So that needs to be uh, clearly communicated or overly communicated just, just to make sure because wasted time is a terrible, um, terrible mistake in, in the process. And there were a lot of um, time spent more than we expected sometimes. I want to say the majority of the time, but like uh, there were a lot of instances where their estimation is difficult, partially because we're building something new, um, partially because the expectation was um, not quite clearly um, transferred. Uh, second thing is to educate, to, to, to document. I feel like document is not enough of a word because document sometimes uh, what I found is uh, realistic, realistic, realistically speaking, if you write a document, people might not have the time to read it. So if you can talk to people, or if you have chances to hold like uh, talks or presentations in, in, in your studio or in other places, do it because sharing knowledge is good. Uh, everybody benefits from it. Um, so third thing is to accumulate both as a personal level or as um, as a studio level to, to, to build up your study notes because there are so much information out there, it's easy to forget if you don't have notes and to build up uh, modular tools so you can build up to something higher. Um, I want to make a pet case for a proper system. Um, one time I received feedback about uh, uh, maybe I should not be building systems that's uh, too watertight and necessary. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll do a trade-off analysis of this this argument. So so, so the full argument is that um, it does push you to 100 120%, as I see it. So you can end up with something like 95%. Grit. That's something I learned um, when I was a kid, that when you try to shoot for something high, you end up was a good thing, but like not as high as what you're shooting for. Um, so in order to have a good result, it, it benefits to to aim higher. The other thing is that it forces you to fight like harder fights, um, in a sense, which will result in experiences that cannot be documented for the collective benefits if the fight is evaded in the first place. It, it might be easy to for for convenience reasons to just do things the old way or do things uh, the fast way. Um, and not the proper way. And the prop the, the proper I'm trying to define here is um, more like a scientific term in terms of if you know a problem and the problem is described more properly in some formula and you don't build that in that way or you don't try to find the formula that, 
that, that accurately describe this behavior in uh, our simulation, for example, and, and you fake it, then it's sort of improper. And proper system might be expensive to build, but the, the idea is that once you cross the threshold, a, a good quality threshold, it becomes so much better than uh, what you can fake. Uh, one thing I coined here is called a coil test. If you think of a coil as a bit of like the iteration process, it just goes around and around in circles and it pro 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 progress forward slowly. And here, um, it basically means the cost of a manual fix. If there's a problem, the cost of the fix times the occurring rate times the iteration. So if something um, occurs only in one iteration, then that's one. If that problem has, every time you change something, for instance, if we have to fix some agent behavior in our simulation, if we do it manually, and every time we, we re-same the thing, different group of agents have problems. So you, that that give you a multiply in terms of iteration. So those three things uh, multiplied together, plus a possible, this is potential, it's not necessary, but a potential loss of quality coming from the fact that um, um, improper systems sometimes do not have the new ones of, of a natural system that simulate the, the behavior of a thing. For instance, the, the, the space transition method simulates the behavior of a pattern. Uh, it doesn't just simulate the appearance of it. So when you do that, you have a, a higher tendency to reach a better quality result. So basically compare that against the, the cost of the system that proceeds to catch the problem. So top top line, manual catch, uh, bottom line, a more expensive system that will proceed to catch the problem. Compare those two and decide whether you whether it's worth the investment to yeah, to, to make the production decision here. So I call it the core test. A little bit of a inside your kind of top left there. This is the final frame. Um, for my allies the data. And a part of a data it is. One extra quote. Close your eyes, feel it. The geometry spreadsheet, it's always been there. It will guide you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for attending the talk. I know it's over time. I apologize for that. Um, if you have any questions, you can probably reach me uh, through through side effects. Um, if you have specific questions about uh, what, 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 what we built and, and how we built things, I'm happy to, to answer it. Thank you.